Um, it's my pleasure to in introduce Professor Ben Tycho from Columbia University. He's at the Life Sciences Division there. Uh, he's got a very focused interest in genetic and epigenetic basis for phenotypes in Down syndrome. Thanks, Richard. Okay, thanks uh, to the organizers for the nice invitation. And let me start up here. I use a PDF uh, just to be super safe. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I'm trying to adhere to the, uh, some of the format that was sent around. Um, I'm going to talk about epigenetics, and uh, specifically DNA methylation and Down syndrome. Uh, but I'll start with, uh, start with the end here. Uh, I think that our work, which I'll show you, leads to the idea that nutritional preclinical and then clinical trials in Down syndrome uh, might benefit from this, uh, some of the data that I'm going to show you on DNA methylation and Down syndrome. And uh, that, uh, wait, I'm starting from the end here. Wait a minute, that's slide 24. <laughs> that's, I should have used that. But, but I wasn't so far off. So I'm going to show you good evidence for altered DNA methylation in Down syndrome, both in blood and brain tissues. But uh, the, uh, obviously, these alterations are, we've just published this last year, and these alterations have not yet been capitalized on for uh, therapeutic targeting and treating Down syndrome. So I think that the conclusion is going to be that preclinical trials in mouse models and clinical trials in people with Down syndrome uh, should be um, organized to take advantage of these data. So uh, DNA methylation is the most famous epigenetic uh, mark on the DNA. Epigenetics, in the most useful definition of the word, deals with chemical marks on the DNA or the histones that, uh, around which the DNA is wrapped uh, that influence gene expression. And um, of all those chemical marks, and there are many, DNA methylation is the one where we really understand how the patterns get copied faithfully, under some circumstances faithfully, in each somatic cell division as the tissue uh, grows during development. And that is simply there's an enzyme, DNMT1, that recognizes the hemimethylated sites on the new DNA strands and remethylates them with very high affinity. But under other circumstances, DNA methylation pa Next time will be PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm just going to use the arrows. Um, but under other circumstances, uh, for example, with, with low levels of DNMT1 and uh, with, as I'll, with, as I'll show you, um, drugs and nutritional manipulation, um, DNA methylation patterns can change. And there are de novo uh, methyltransferase enzymes that can institute new patterns, and DNA methylation patterns can be lost when the DNA replicates in the absence of the maintenance methyltransferase DNA T1. So that's a big aspect, of basic aspect of the field right now. Why study this? When methylation occurs in gene promoters, uh, it, it's a very effective mechanism for silencing gene expression. When it occurs elsewhere, such as in insulator regions of the genome, it can actually activate gene expression. And methylation becomes abnormal in many common diseases. Really, the area of studying DNA methylation is, is uh, 30 years old, and it, most of the original work was done in cancer. We also work on altered DNA methylation in cancer. But now, uh, through efforts by me and my colleagues, the NIH you know, has become very interested in this, and it's part of the NIH roadmap to study uh, epigenomic patterns, not just in cancer, but in other diseases. So in the first batch of grants issued by the NIH in the roadmap for epigenomics, four out of 20 grants were actually dealing with Alzheimer's disease, not with cancer. And um, lastly, um, studying methylation patterns can uh, highlight some very interesting genetic epigenetic interactions. And, uh, of course, that's very relevant in Down syndrome, uh, which I'll get to. So, but I want to show just one slide from the cancer area. This is, these are our data, uh, which paper that is under review. I didn't used to believe that folic acid supplementation could really do that much 
uh, I just, it just didn't click for me. But there, of course, is a huge literature on effective folic acid supplementation for this and that. And one of the uh, gastroenterology fellows in my lab said, Look, can I just buy this special diet for the expensive diet for the mice? And he gave it, and it's a, mo it's a mouse model of stomach cancer, which is very faithful to human stomach cancer. And if you start folic acid at weaning in these mice, you just prevent the cancer. You can see the stomach over there on the, on the right side is starting folic acid at weaning. It's a, just a normal stomach. It doesn't get cancer. It's just amazing. And I watched them open these mice because I didn't believe anything was going to be, but it's true. So diet can influence DNA methylation and in so doing can influence uh, important diseases. So um, I was talking about genetic, epigenetic interactions. So here, this is in the context of Down syndrome, a potential trans interaction. You have an extra copy of chromosome 21. And does the presence of that extra copy of this little chromosome influence genome-wide uh, DNA methylation patterns? That was the question that we set out to ask. And we asked that question to understand the, the main point here. Uh, Madame Lejeune is here. We, we've known for 50 years the etiology of Down syndrome was trisomy 21. But we still don't know the pathogenesis. So it's events downstream of the trisomy that are important. And I'm going to start with our analysis of blood. And so it's important to take a step back. We've heard a lot about the brain, um, some of it, uh, some scary uh, images of amyloid. And, um, but there are also blood phenotypes uh, in Down syndrome that are interesting and important for, for quality of life, I believe. Childhood leukemias, uh, not so relevant to what I'm going to say, but also in later childhood and early adulthood and late adulthood, altered immune function leading to a sort of mild immunodeficiency and increased infections, both viral and bacterial, as well as this 50-fold, well-known 50-fold increase in autoimmune diseases, alopecia areata with hair loss has already been mentioned, celiac disease, thyroid disease in part uh, due to autoimmunity. This is what you see when you profile DNA methylation. Red is more methylation, blue is less methylation. The cases and controls are along the top. The genes are down the side. And you can see recurrent differences. That is, not very many genes affected. This is, these are only lists of about 60 to 100 genes shown here in these methylation heat maps. But highly recurrent changes of a few genes in Down syndrome blood. You can see on the very right some cancers. These are acute myeloid leukemias. The extent of the difference and the places where the difference occur in cancer are very different. And uh, the extent is, is greater. But you have these relatively mild but very reproducible changes. For the best markers that we found in Down syndrome, the changes are not at all mild and in, indeed diagnostic. And so here you see normal blood. The, the black circles are methylated cytosines. The white circles are unmethylated cytosines. We simply do what's called bisulfite conversion of the DNA that leads to this binary readout. We can see these, the status of each cytosine. And we compare uh, two different um, individuals with Down syndrome to two uh, normal individuals here by two different methods. They both say the same thing. There's a huge difference at this marker. But this is our, was our best marker gene, TMEM131, transmembrane protein gene. There are other genes with very uh, say, black and white differences as well. Black and white is a good term for this. Uh, the difference at the edge of the CD3 zeta CD247 gene on the right is highly reproducible. It only affects a limited cluster of CPGs, but it's very reproducible. And this is the major signal transducing uh, element in T lymphocytes, accounting for effective T-mediated uh, cellular immunity. So these genes make sense. Uh, and you can, we, with our collaborators, Nicole Schupf and Wayne Silverman and Warren Zygman at IBR, we uh, have followed a large cohort of individuals, adults with uh, Down syndrome. And you can see, let me show you this. For the TMEM, the best marker, what's happening here. That's the upper left panel. And the green are normal controls over a range of age. Methylation can change with age in normals. And you see this decline in methylation. Look at the blue stars at the at the top, those are cord blood, so that's at birth. 
So this is a dramatic age-related decline in, in the normal controls. In adults with Down syndrome, there's, by this molecular test for the first time, you can see, I think, there's a little bit of hand-waving in premature uh, aging in Down syndrome. But here, I think, you see a premature aging of the immune system that's quantitative. So that was interesting. But not, the other genes don't have this age dependence. But nonetheless, the p-values are off the wall significant for these genes. And this is a functionally relevant. We can treat with a demethylating drug, take normal blood cells. Many of these genes lose methylation in Down syndrome. So we can treat the normal blood cells have more methylation. We treat with decidabine, which is a drug, a fairly safe drug used in human cancer patients. And we treat those normal cells, and they, their gene expression becomes like Down syndrome cells when we demethylate. So demethylating is bad for these genes. But adding folate, folic acid supplementation, I think, is a reasonable thing to begin to think about, because that's the opposite of demethylation. That folic acid is a methyl donor and would make these genes in Down syndrome patients more normal in the blood. I'm not talking about brain. I'm not talking about curing Alzheimer's disease. That's very, very important, but that's not what I'm talking about. Here. And in fact, the genes, this best marker, TMEM, we've made the, the conditional knockout mice, and uh, thankfully we see that they, are, they do in fact die in the, in the perinatal period when you completely delete the gene. Now we're using the special recombinases to delete it only in the T cells and see what the phenotype is. So they have a phenotype, in other words. Now, what about the brain? Just briefly, I probably need to close soon, but we've also looked, of course, in brain tissue. Dr. Yerji Vengel at IBR has this precious collection of uh, Down syndrome uh, brains uh, from autopsies at over a range of age, and um, he's an excellent um, compulsive neuropathologist, so we get exactly the right regions and so on, and uh, also was a lieutenant in the Polish army and speaks like a lieutenant from the Polish army. So I just go over to visit him, and then I say, hi, Jerzy, and then I stop, and he just talks to me, and then I go, hi, Jerzy. Okay. So uh, anyway, he has uh, given us these, these samples, and uh, there's dramatic differences in DNA methylation in the cerebellum here. And, and because the controls in the cases are matched very carefully, that's the point I was making about yours. Uh, but look at this. The, the Down syndrome brains exclusively, almost exclusively, have the red color. They're gaining methylation in the brain, not losing it. <coughs> And we can validate these genes. This one's very interesting. It's outside the TS65DN region, but it's an interesting gene on 21, suggesting a sort of dosage compensation, partially by methylation, which we can talk about if people are interested. It's a DNA repair gene. Look at this on the denser array. Gains only, almost only gains of methylation. It turns out there's a gene for, uh, the me for methyltransferase, DNMT3L, that localizes to chromosome 21 and is overrepresented, therefore. So this may account for this selective gain of methylation, and we're exploring this possibility. It's just a hypothesis, but this is clearly non-random. And there's even support for the dosage, partial dosage compensation hypothesis here, because if you look at the overall representation of hypermethylated genes and divide by the gene content of each chromosome, even though the numbers of genes are low, it's actually statistically significant that chromosome 21 goes to the top of the list. This is not, you know, I just sorted this in Excel. 21 goes to the top. But only four genes. We need to do uh, more arrays to get more genes and see if this holds up, that this might be a partial dosage compensation. Okay, the people who did the work, I'm listing both our collaborators at Columbia and IBR and at Scripps for bioinformatics and the people working so hard uh, in my lab. So the status, so the status report, uh, where's the phone that goes ding ding? 50 seconds, you got two minutes and 50 seconds. So that's perfect, so there's two more slides. So the resources, I think, for the blood phenotypes, for improving the mild immunodeficiency, for preventing autoimmunity, Folic acid wor is worth revisiting. Has it been used before in Down syndrome? Yes. And the most recent paper I see is actually from the UK, and it's a negative finding. Negative with regard to what? Negative with regard to neurocognitive. Over a brief period of supplementation, but not, they don't measure as an endpoint overall health in that study. So I think that's worth revisiting. And basically that's what I wanted to say. We need money, 
and we can benefit uh, people with Down syndrome by fewer infections, but, uh, which may lead to better growth and learning, okay? So you could even imagine with, with recurrent otitis media as an infection, if recurrent otitis media was reduced, you might have better learning independent of rescuing anything actually within the brain, which is the brain data will ultimately make some suggestions about brain-directed therapy, but even directing therapy at blood cells may start to help, okay? I'll take any questions. Okay, I've got a question at the back. Okay, yeah, yeah. And we did measure health, but that bit never got published. Um, okay. so I, did you see anything good? No, no effect at all. We, we, did a, we had a big health questionnaire, and we had lots of height and weight. We did hearing check, nothing. We had no health outcomes, unfortunately, okay. from folate. So. How, do you, how do you... So I'm just trying to think about how this, this changing pattern arises. So there's a consistent pattern of abnormalities in the periphery and the brain. And these changes are apparently highly predictable, presumably have biological significance. How do they become so regular? How, well, how to explain the exclu these really exclusive patterns of methylation, increased or decreased? So I think in the, in the blood, it's explained by the, the fact that blood is produced every day, blood cells are produced every day by stem cell compartment in the bone marrow. So you have a lot of turnover in the blood lineages and a lot of Darwinian, somatic Darwinian selection. And you end up with these very specific abnormalities mm -hmm. that allow uh, the blood cells to survive in the presence of trisomy 21. And some of those abnormalities in turn lead to abnormal blood function. And they, in the so brain, that can be way different. down. So that could be way downstream from some initiating. That's event. right. Yeah. But it's recurrent and, and yeah. stereotypical. In the brain, we see totally different genes affected, and that must be uh, developmental and perhaps less far downstream, because it's in the brain where we see 21 chromosome 21 genes affected. So if so, just to go back to the mouse work now, if one were to delete DNMT 3A, whatever it is, yep. in a TS60 in the in the in the full chromosomal complement. You know, one could ask this question, is that gene responsible? Is an extra copy of that gene responsible for what we're seeing? Would that be her hypothesis? That would be great experiment. Yeah, okay. Really, do very doable, very doable. Other questions? There are studies do you showing want, do you want that... To do it? You want to do it? We should do that for yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are studies showing that high dose of folic acid can cause cancer. Uh, so what was the dose you used in, in your mice model? So there's, there's not studies showing that folic acid can cause cancer, but there are studies showing that if the cancer is already there, it may be not good to, to be giving folic acid. The, the folic acid as chemo prevention, which we used here, which was 5x minimum daily requirements counterpart for a mouse, uh, is this is very effective for chemo prevention. The reason it might aggravate the problem once the cancer is already established is that you have hypermethylation of tumor suppressor genes as part of the cancer process, so you don't want to aggravate that hypermethylation once the cancer is already established. And many of these studies that you're referring to come from the min mouse where you have colon polyps and uh, those, those start up very early, so you don't want to give folate once you have advanced uh, colon polyps. But this, this is uh, uh, inflammatory gastric cancer system, which starting early was very effective. Yes. Um, there is a very important point you raised with the epigenetics, what is in the blood and what is in the brain, because some of the cells are neuroectodermal, and what is very interesting, I do not know how many people looked on that APP in chromosome 21, and on the both side of, within few um, millimeters, there is many carotene genes. So and they are all neuroectodermal. Yep. So epigenetically, they are inside the brain, and what that doing, rest of your life, you don't know. So that's why maybe the difference between the blood and the brain, yep. epigenetically. Well, the uh, it's possible. I mean, the genes that we're landing on in the brain analysis are 
fundamental transcription factors. C21 ORF is, an, mm -hmm. is an, in, not a transcription factor, but it's involved in nuclear processes. And RUNX1 is also coming up as a very strong hit, which is very fundamental. Is this published, by the way? The, the, the brain list? is not published. The blood yeah. is published. When are you going to publish the brain? Uh, we probably will be able to submit in about a month. Yeah, uh, it's really important to have the list. Great, great list. So please publish <laughs> soon. Please publish soon.